It's a big day in the life of any British monarch, and indeed the whole country. But just why are coronations important? What exactly happens during them? How has the ceremony changed over the centuries? And how does it differ for a single person versus a monarch with a spouse? In this week's video from History Calling, we'll look at the coronations of English, Scottish and British sovereigns over the past 1,000 years or so to answer these questions, and hear about some of the triumphs and mishaps which have befallen several kings and queens at this crucial moment. Let's start with the origins and purpose of coronations. I'm going to be focusing on the post-1066 period in this video, but English coronation services do predate this, and the basics of the current ceremony were already in use in 973 when King Edgar was crowned at Bath Abbey. As for their purpose, originally they were required in order to make a monarch a monarch. Back in the medieval period, there weren't the kind of clear-cut, supposedly unbreakable succession rules that we have today, and if you didn't have a coronation, you weren't the ruler, no matter how good your blood claim on the throne may have been. This is exemplified by the case of Empress Matilda, daughter and heiress of Henry I. She should have become queen upon her father's death in 1135, but she was beaten to the punch by her cousin, King Stephen, who made it back to England before she did. Both were in modern-day France at the time of Henry's death, and Stephen had himself crowned. Matilda, who was an empress by virtue of her first marriage, did succeed in ousting him some years later and was all set to have her own coronation, but after losing much of the support she had built up amongst many English magnates and the wider population, supposedly thanks to her difficult and demanding personality, it all fell apart, and she ended up never being crowned after all. As a result, Stephen is remembered as a king, but Matilda is not listed as one of England's queens. By the late 15th century, the legal importance of the ceremony had diminished considerably, and it was no longer necessary to be crowned in order to be recognised as the ruler, with the ceremony taking on a more symbolic meaning whilst also providing an excuse to essentially have a big party. Thus, young Edward V, more often remembered as one of the princes in the Tower, was and is recognised as a King of England, despite having never been crowned after his accession in 1483. The same goes for Edward VIII, who was king from January to December 1936, before abdicating to marry Wallace Simpson. William IV didn't even want to have a coronation in 1831, feeling it wasn't worth the hassle or expense, and had to be talked into it. The fact that a coronation was what made a sovereign legitimate for many centuries, however, meant that they had to take place very quickly after said sovereign's accession, usually within days or at most a few weeks. Harold Godwinson was crowned the day after Edward the Confessor's death in January 1066, and when he was killed at the Battle of Hastings on the 14th of October that year, William the Conqueror was crowned on Christmas Day following, the two-and-a-half-month delay only caused by the need to solidify his hold over England and get to London. Nowadays, of course, kings and queens aren't under the same kind of pressure, and can take a year or more to plan out an elaborate service with all the trappings. In fact, Charles III's coronation, less than a year after the death of Elizabeth II, is actually unusually quick by modern standards. What is more normal now, though, is for coronations to take place during late spring or summer, in the hopes of better weather. Elizabeth II's was on the 2nd of June 1953, for instance, and her son's was set for the 6th of May 2023. William the Conqueror was the first monarch we know was crowned in Westminster Abbey, and the tradition has persisted for English monarchs all the way down to the present day. In the medieval period, Scottish kings were traditionally inaugurated at Scone, whilst sitting on the Stone of Scone, sometimes called the Stone of Destiny. But this was stolen by Edward I of England in 1296 and taken to London, where a specially built chair was created to house it, now known as the Coronation Chair. Barring a brief period in 1950-51 to 51 when it was stolen by Scottish nationalists, it remained in Westminster Abbey for nearly 700 years, and was used in the coronations of English, later British monarchs. It was then returned to Scotland in 1996, with the proviso that it be brought back to London for all future coronations. 
Later Scottish coronations took place in other locations, including Stirling for the baby James VI in 1567, who inherited the crown after his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, was forced to abdicate. James later became King of England in 1603 and was followed by his son, Charles I, who ascended to the throne in 1625. Charles didn't prioritise a Scottish coronation though, not going north of the border to be crowned until 1633. The Scottish coronation of his son, Charles II, was the last held in that country and took place on New Year's Day 1651. This was during the interregnum when Oliver Cromwell and the parliamentarians had taken control of England and were trying to tame Scotland too, and when Charles, who spent most of the 1650s in exile on mainland Europe, was eventually restored to the throne of England as well, he had another coronation in Westminster Abbey in 1661. The format of a coronation has changed considerably over the centuries, and though the ceremony retains some aspects which even William the Conqueror would still recognise, it now includes others which he could never have dreamt of. Proceedings generally begin with some sort of procession to Westminster Abbey, from wherever the monarch stayed the night before. Once upon a time, that would have been the Tower of London, originally intended as a royal residence, not a prison, but now it's Buckingham Palace. The Golden State Coach, which is now such a fixture of these processions, was first used in 1821 for the coronation of George IV, and you can see it here ten years later at the coronation of William IV and Queen Adelaide. But previous monarchs could travel in another carriage or litter or even walk. Queen Anne was in such poor health in 1702 that she had to be carried in an open sedan chair. The range of participants in this procession has changed over time to take into account the evolving nature of England, then Britain, then the United Kingdom, then the Commonwealth. That for George V, for instance, in 1911, included standard bearers carrying the flags of the likes of New Zealand and Australia, not something one would have seen in the medieval period. Once at the Abbey, there is another procession through it in order to get the monarch to their chair of estate. Most of the guests will have been in their seats for hours before the main event starts, and only the monarch, their consort if they have one, their attendants, and the state officials, lay people, churchmen and women involved, will actually process, though this can still be a pretty large group. In terms of guests, they attend by invite only, and 8,000 people were at Elizabeth II's coronation, though it was an exceptionally large event, and the trend nowadays is to go for smaller, more streamlined royal ceremonies with fewer people and a lower price tag. Monarchs of other countries do not usually go, instead sending representatives from their families. I'm not sure why this is, but it might be a precedence thing. It would be tough to have multiple monarchs and consorts all together at once and work out who should get to sit where and who bows or doesn't bow to whom. The coronation regalia, which are only a portion of the crown jewels by the way, are brought to the abbey the day before the service and can then be carried during the procession. In centuries past though, when the coronation still symbolised the making of a monarch, they were only brought on the day and carried in in front of the new king to show that he wasn't sovereign yet, and therefore had to walk behind the symbols of majesty. The English medieval regalia were almost entirely destroyed by Oliver Cromwell and his followers in 1649, and only the spoon you see here survives. Many of the other pieces were created at the time of the restoration of the monarchy for the 1661 coronation, and others have been added in as time has gone on. Some of the most important pieces are St Edward's crown, used at the actual moment of crowning, and the lighter imperial state crown, used in other parts of the ceremony. There is also the orb and the scepter. The Scottish regalia are not used in the ceremony, but they are much older and were dramatically hidden from the Cromwellians during the interregnum, just one of their many adventures, by the way. The exact order the ceremony takes place in can vary a little, but traditionally there is the recognition, whereby the monarch is proclaimed king or queen in the north, south, east and west of the abbey, and recognised as such by those in attendance with loud acclamations. You can see the recognition of George IV in 1821 here, for instance, but unfortunately for those in the vicinity of William the Conqueror's coronation, these shouts were mistaken for a fight breaking out inside the abbey, and in response, his soldiers outside the building set fire to the local populace's houses. 
A coronation must also include the taking of the coronation oath, which is considered the only legal requirement for the whole ritual, yet also isn't necessary to make a monarch a monarch. Those kings I mentioned earlier, for instance, who never had a coronation, also obviously never took the oath. There had been a separate Scottish oath, but like I said, no one after Charles II was crowned in Scotland. His brother and successor, James II, took no Scottish oath at all, while the joint monarchs William III and Mary II took the oath in England in lieu of any separate northern coronation, setting a precedent which Mary's sister Queen Anne would later follow. The oath has changed many times over the past millennium. It is usually administered by the Archbishop of Canterbury and takes the form of a series of questions and responses. It's rather long to read out here, but it essentially asks the monarch to promise to rule their realms according to the laws and customs of those countries, to show mercy in all their judgments, and to respect and uphold whatever branch of the Christian faith is then the official church in England. This last part in particular has had some reworking over the years to accommodate major changes such as the Reformation, which saw England go from a predominantly Catholic country to a predominantly Protestant one. At Queen Elizabeth II's coronation, after she had completed the responses, she went and knelt at the altar, placed her hand on a copy of the Bible, and swore that, The things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. She then kissed the Bible and signed a copy of her oath. There is also something called an accession oath, which dates to the time of Queen Anne. It is taken at around the same time as the coronation oath if it hasn't already been sworn at the first state opening of Parliament of the Reign. It was originally intended as something of a bulwark against the Catholic faith and was somewhat amended in 1910 to make it less offensive to non-Protestants. One of the other most important parts of the ceremony is the anointing with holy oil, which takes place once the monarch is seated in St Edward's chair, above the Stone of Schoon. There's a compartment in the chair designed to hold the stone, remember. When the ceremony was televised for the first time in 1953, this section was blocked from the cameras by a canopy held over the Queen, as it is considered one of the most sacred parts of the whole service. The oil is held in an ampulla and doled out using the ancient golden spoon I mentioned earlier. The Royal Collections website explains the history and significance of this event, saying, The anointing is the most sacred part of the coronation ceremony and takes place before the investiture and crowning. The Archbishop pours holy oil from the ampulla or vessel into the spoon and anoints the sovereign on the hands, breast and head. The tradition goes back to the Old Testament, where the anointing of Solomon by Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet is described. Anointing was one of the medieval holy sacraments, and it emphasised the spiritual status of the sovereign. Until the 17th century, the sovereign was considered to be appointed directly by God, and this was confirmed by the ceremony of anointing. Although the monarch is no longer considered divine in the same way, the ceremony of coronation also confirms the monarch as the supreme governor of the Church of England. The oil for Charles III's coronation was consecrated at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem by the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Theophilus III, and the Anglican Archbishop in Jerusalem, Hussam Naum. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. This consecration was announced on the Royal Family's website on the 3rd of March 2023, which also explained that the oil has been created using olives harvested from two groves on the Mount of Olives at the Monastery of Mary Magdalene, where Charles's paternal grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece, is buried, and the Monastery of the Ascension. The olives were pressed just outside Bethlehem. The oil has been perfumed with essential oils, sesame, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, neroli, benzoin and amber, as well as orange blossom. The coronation oil is based on the oil used at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, the formula of which has been used for hundreds of years. It will also be used for the anointing of Her Majesty, the Queen Consort. I don't know about you, but it sounds like coronation oil smells pretty amazing. Of course, no coronation would be complete without a crowning. This is directly preceded by the investiture of the king or queen when they are invested with their coronation robes and items including the spurs and the sword of state. 
The orb, scepter and rod are also given to them, they don't have to hold them all at once, and the coronation ring is placed upon the fourth finger of their right hand, though Queen Victoria's was rammed onto the wrong finger and she had to use ice to get it off later. Finally, and with the monarch still sitting on St Edward's chair, St Edward's crown is placed upon their head, the only time in their reign that they will wear this item. When this is done, all the assembled princes, princesses, peers and peeresses can put their own coronets on. The monarch can then move from the very old and delicate coronation chair to a more modern, less fragile throne and receive homage from the assembled peers. Prior to 1902, this was an arduous process as every single one of them had to approach and carry out this task, and it led to a serious mishap during Victoria's coronation when the aged and ironically named Lord Rule fell over and rolled at her feet. Since the 1902 coronation of Edward VII, however, only the senior peer in each rank, meaning one duke, one marquis, one earl, one viscount and one baron, had to do this greatly reducing the amount of time this section of the coronation lasts, and in January 2023, it was reported that perhaps only Prince William, the Prince of Wales, would be required to do so at the coronation of his father. The traditional words of the homage are as follows. I, then the person says their name, do become your liegeman of life and limb and of earthly worship, and faith and truth I will bear unto you, to live and die against all manner of folks, so help me God. Another element of the service, which has been cut, helping to reduce its length, is the coronation sermon, which has not been given since 1838. I really hope you're enjoying this video. If so, please remember to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below, as this really helps to let YouTube know that you like it. I'd love to have you subscribe to the channel too, so that you can join me for future videos. And if you want even more from me, do check out my social media and Patreon sites, which are linked in the description box below, and where I share additional perks, including early access to ad-free videos. But what about a consort, if there is one? Husbands of Queen's Regnant are not crowned, so prior to 2023, the last joint coronation of a king and queen consort was that of George VI and Elizabeth Bowes Lyon in 1937. In such cases, the queen consort is also anointed, crowned and enthroned like her husband, but she does not have to take an oath. For her to be enthroned, of course, she has to have her own throne, and the one you see here was created for Mary II. It is obviously a dupe for St Edward's chair, but if you're ever unsure, the easiest way to tell the difference is that Mary's throne doesn't have the Stone of Schoon in it, or a slot in the base for that stone to sit in. While a new crown is usually commissioned for each new consort, Queen Camilla broke with precedent in February 2023 when Buckingham Palace announced that she would be crowned with the 1911 crown which Mary of Teck, wife of George V, had commissioned and worn. A coronation consort crown has not been reused since Caroline of Ansbach, wife of George II, wore the crown of Mary of Modena, wife of James II, back in 1727, and the palace statement added that this decision was made, quote, in the interests of sustainability and efficiency, and that the alterations being made to the crown ahead of the big day, quote, will in particular pay tribute to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, as the crown will be reset with the Cullinan three, four, and five diamonds. The diamonds were part of Queen Elizabeth II's personal jewellery collection for many years and were often worn by Her Late Majesty as brooches. In addition, four of the crown's eight detachable arches will be removed to create a different impression to when the crown was worn by Queen Mary at the 1911 coronation. Not all consorts have been crowned, however. Henry VIII, for instance, was crowned alongside his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, in 1509, and held another coronation for wife number two, Anne Boleyn, in 1533, but none of his later four wives were accorded such an honour. George I had divorced and imprisoned his wife, Sophia Dorothea, in the 1690s, decades before he became King of England in 1714, and though he may have gone through a morganatic marriage with his mistress, Erengard Melusina von der Schulenburg, more easily remembered as the Duchess of Kendal, she certainly wasn't crowned with him. Then there's Caroline of Brunswick. She had been long estranged from her husband, George IV, by the time he finally ascended to the throne in 1820, and when she showed up at the coronation in 1821 to take her place as queen, she was dramatically refused entry to the abbey and had to leave. 
but back to more successful royal marriages and coronations. When the crowning was over with at the coronation of Elizabeth II, she and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, took Holy Communion before the Queen briefly retired to St Edward's Chapel. There she changed into simpler robes and put on the imperial state crown, after which there was procession out of the Abbey and back to Buckingham Palace. Since 1902, it has been a tradition that the monarch and members of their family appear on the palace's famous balcony once they arrive back and wave to the crowds, with Elizabeth, Philip and their entourage obliged to go out five separate times. The 20th century also brought other elements to Coronation Day, which previous monarchs had never seen or had to contend with. These include the use of still cameras at first, then eventually full-scale filming of almost the entire event, by the bits held beneath a canopy such as the anointing. There were also flybys of the palace by Royal Air Force planes, and George VI introduced the Coronation radio broadcast in 1937, which I think must have been a pretty big deal for him as he was a well-known stammerer. New innovations for Charles III's coronation celebrations included the announcement of a coronation concert at Windsor Castle the day after the main event, as well as a coronation big lunch scheduled for the same day and designed to be a nationwide act of celebration and friendship. Prior to William IV's very stripped-back coronation, there used to be a coronation banquet held in Westminster Hall after the ceremony, but that was very expensive and was never reinstated after he refused to hold one bringing an end to about 650 years of tradition. At such banquets, though, the guests were treated to the sight of the monarch's champion riding in on horseback, who would then throw down his gauntlet three times in front of the assembled personages, daring any of them to dispute the ruler's right to the crown, and offering to fight any such naysayers. I don't have stats on how often his horse pooped on the floor of the medieval Westminster Hall, but let's be realistic and say that it probably wasn't an infrequent occurrence. Despite the fact that such banquets are now technically a thing of the past, other smaller dinners, lunches and receptions are held in the days around a coronation to entertain foreign dignitaries and other attendees. There's no knight in shining armour riding around them on horseback, although such a champion did appear in outdoor processions in 1902 to mark Edward VII's coronation. And that, my friends, is the basic history and format of a British coronation ritual and the surrounding ceremonies and events. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about it. If you'd like to learn more, I recommend a very informative report released by the House of Commons Library, which was the main secondary source I used to help me with this video, and which I'll leave linked below for you. As always, thank you to my patrons and those of you who donate to the channel using the thanks button beneath videos for your unstinting kindness and generosity. Let me know below if you think there still ought to be separate English and Scottish coronations, and why not check out my dedicated coronations playlist, which will take you through the stories behind specific crown jewels, the Stone of Schoon, and the coronations of particular monarchs. Whatever you select, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning.